Today is Monday, August 14th, 2017, and we are interviewing Christopher DeMaio at the Aptos Public Library in Aptos, California. My name is Jeannie Zarnicki, David Addison is recording, and Julie Richardson will be indexing the video. We work for the Santa Cruz Public Libraries, and this interview is being conducted for the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress. Chris, when and where were you born? Well, I was born in 1940, May of 1940, in Providence, Rhode Island. Huh. Tell us a little bit about your family background and growing up in Rhode Island. Well, um, my father comes from a very large uh, Italian family that well, they came to the United States. My grandfather came to the United States. And uh, my mother uh, came from Ireland. So I'm sort of like first generation. Grew up in um, South Providence, which is probably the, the poorest area of Providence. My family was, was pretty poor. And uh, I had a wonderful childhood. My, uh, I never knew my mother's side of the family. They were still in Ireland. But I did know my father's side, which was a very large, very warm, supportive Italian family. And um, so I, I hung out with my, had a lot of cousins, hung out with my cousins a lot, and um, had a lot of friends in my uh, community in South Providence. At that time, the neighborhood I grew up in mainly had a lot of refugees from or before uh, World War II, a lot of Jews. And um, actually there was an Albanian and a, and a couple of Polish people, mainly, mainly um, refugees. And so I was very familiar with what was going on in, in Europe at the time. I do remember World War II. Uh, I remember um, having to, to stop everything while they had um, air raid drills and they'd have a, a, a person standing on the, the corner, a, a warden, air raid warden. Um, at that time, my uncle Mike, who was another physician, who was sort of like my, my role model at this point, um, was in the military. And he landed at D-Day and went all the way through the war. Um, my uh, neighbor, uh, Dick Dawson, uh, who I remember very vividly throwing me up in the air as a kid, and he made me a, a, a model plane. Um, he was in parachute, uh, a, you know, air, one of the, the people who go in parachutes, and uh, he was he was killed in Germany. Uh, I really remember that because uh, in Rhode Island they would name the um, blocks after someone who was killed, and I remember that very vividly. And I also remember my dad taking me downstairs in the cellar playing, and which was unfinished. It was an awful cellar. Anyway, he came down with a, um, a, a tube, a copper tube, and it had made, he made it into a bomb. And he said, today we dropped a bomb on Japan that wiped out an entire city. And I really remember that. Um, so I, I grew up during World War II. And, um, and knew people who had fought in it, people who were prisoners. And um, it definitely made an impression on me. The, uh, my father owned an ice cream factory and also did oil. And so when I was a kid growing up to earn money, I would work during the day with him, like Saturday morning, and I'd be given a quarter, and I could go to the movies, and buy a piece, some candy, which you can't do anymore. <laughs> <I've recorded. laughs> but um, those those were different days. So um, that was about it. Um, went to uh, to Henry Bonnard School. Even though my parents were very poor, they put a very high uh, stake on education. They really encouraged all of us. Uh, had one brother, two sisters, and they really pushed us to get education. And uh, they sent me to Henry Barnard, which was a private school, which, which was really good. Um, I still remember my first science experiment, which was getting dirt and putting it into a bottle, letting it dry out, and putting water in, and seeing the bubbles and going, oh yeah, 
that's air. <laughs> <laughs> you know, another one where they would play piano, so they'd have us go to, um, to a concert. And then on the way back, we went back to school, and then the teacher was in the piano playing, and we had to feel the, what it felt like, the music felt like. And then we had to draw the music. So they, they really did all sorts of very intriguing things when I was in high school. Then I went to uh, junior high, which was just an awful experience. <laughs> I think it was for many people. And then left early to go to Classical High, which is the high school in Providence, where basically you're going there if you're you know, heading to college. Uh, and there were 30 people in my class. And I still keep in contact with some of them. So that was, that was my early life. And, and when, when did you join the service? Were you drafted or did you join? Well, there's a whole different thing on that one. After, um, after I went to junior high and high school, I then went to the University of Rhode Island. And I was in pre-med there. I went to and um, uh, oddly enough, just a couple of years ago, they gave me an honorary doctorate degree for a lot of what I did with the veterans. And uh, it was really a, a major honor. I mean, one of the other people there was uh, a Supreme Court, uh, uh, so it was Sotomayor, and she was just a wonderful person. Wow. So we had, I had to have dinner with her and stuff like that. It was, it was a fun time, actually. Okay. So after the University of Rhode Island, then I went to Georgetown Medical School. Now at that time, that was 1966, I graduated in 1966. During that time, I was in med school, which is four years, you know, virtually every doctor was being asked to join either the Army, Navy, or Air Force, and that's called the Berry Plan. And you had a chair, they just pa passed out papers one day and said, choose what branch you want to be in and when you want to go, because they desperately needed physicians for Vietnam. So I, from Rhode Island, I was always on the water. I liked the Navy uniform, so I said, oh, I'll join the Navy. The war's going to be over anyway before I finish all my school. Um, well, it, it, it didn't, I chose basically going in after my internship. Did my internship with, um, actually surgical internship, with, um, with, with Cornell Division at uh, North Shore Hospital on Long Island and Bellevue Hospital in New York. And uh, finished that and then it was time to going to the military. So as I finished that, they brought me into the military. Okay. And um, tell us about your, your train, the training that you had before you went. Did you well, <laughs> it was very interesting. They were just wanting to get doctors. And when we arrived in, uh, at St. Albans, which was my first duty station, they didn't even have room for us. They put us up in a hotel. Then we had to go out and buy uniforms. And then supposedly the next day we had to wear them. Well, none of us knew how, how to wear uniforms. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we were medical students, we were doctors. We have no idea. So um, when the time came, I just kind of put buttons where I thought they looked good. And I, I didn't like the black shoes, so I wore my cordovans and argyle socks. And we went out for inspection, and the guy came by and looked at us, stopped in front of me and says, you know, I've always wanted to do this. You're, you're, you're totally out of uniform. And so they finally got around to telling us how to wear a uniform. Uh, the next thing we did was we finally got, got uh, some place to stay in the bachelor's officer's quarters. And my main job there as a general medical officer was to take care of um, a lot of the civilians and also have um, take care of any of the active duty military personnel on a medical basis. 
And we were kind of young and crazy, and one night we were at the um, officer's club, and I guess we were getting kind of rowdy, because the officer of the day came in and said, uh, you're going to have to leave uh, now. <laughs> so we left uh, and noticed as we were leaving that he left his keys in his Jeep. So we said, okay, let's take the Jeep. So we got in the Jeep and we took it, we rode around and we said, okay, now what are we going to do with this? We can't keep it. Well, I've got a good idea. Let's put it on the commanding officer's lawn. So that's what we did. And then we went to bed. Next day we got calls and said, and the guy that called us with me, he looked at me, he goes, you know, this is like, like something out of the movies. <laughs> you know, this is ridiculous. Um, shortly after that, I got a little, um, little notice saying, uh, uh, you're being reassigned to Vietnam. I got, uh, the one who gave me that was one of the chiefs who was very good. When I first got into the military, my, uh, one of my aunts who's, uh, who sued said, whatever you do if you're sent to Vietnam, don't fight like a white man. Don't go down to a path, go, go into the woods, go, you know, don't take the, the easiest trail and learn how to hide, <laughs> learn how to, you know, learn how to not to be visible. Um, so I always had that in my mind. Um, and the chief, who's very good, who gave me this thing of Vietnamese to English and English to Vietnamese, was the one that said, you have to do two things before you go. One is join the um, Navy Federal Credit Union and USAA, which I've done. USAA is, is just absolutely spectacular. I've used that for all my banking, all my insurance. And when I call up now, they go, well, hello, Doc. Hello, Commander DeMaio. Um, thank you for your service. You've been with us since 1967. What can I do to help you? And then they can solve the problem. They've never not solved the problem. Uh, Navy Federal Credit Union I've used for um, uh, you know, financing cars. And actually, I had a, uh, uh, with my house, I had them you know, finance my house at one point. So they were very good very good things that the, the chief gave me. And during that time, I, I developed a very strong appreciation of what the chiefs did and what the corpsmen did, and realized that if I was going to survive this, listen to the corpsmen and the, and the sergeants. Uh, because what they did next was immediately give me to the Marine Corps, uh, which I didn't know they could do. I mean, I wanted to sail, I didn't necessarily want to walk on the ground, <laughs> but there I was. So, uh, I can tell you that I uh, went to, the next thing that happened was a, I went to Camp Pendleton for uh, field medical school, which for me was, was really wonderful. Because for years all I had done was study and I wasn't really able to do very much. And here it was, I could get up, you know, they do calisthenics, then have breakfast, and then take a hike. It was just wonderful. I felt like, this is great. You know, and then come back and eat, and then do more exercises, and go to classes and learn about, you know, war-related injuries, and then go to bed early. I mean, it was just, it was a really pretty good, at, um, time of my life. I thought it was, it was fun. How Learned long how to was do that training? Pardon? How long was it? It was several weeks. Oh, okay. And I think um, they also taught us how to do um, uh, night patrols, ambushes. Um, the one thing I didn't do well in was throwing grenades. I'm not a good <laughs> grenade thrower. And they told, they told me that it, the only time I could throw a grenade is if I was on top of a hill and I threw it down. Yeah, otherwise, I'd kill myself and <laughs> everyone with me. Um, in, in, uh, at the University of Rhode Island, it was, it was, uh, I was in ROTC, so some of this was pretty, um, you know, something I knew before. Uh, I knew how, at that point, I knew how to shoot at least 
an M1, and I was really good at it. Um, I always got overnight in the 90s with, with shooting there. Getting to Vietnam, however, was, was really different. Um, there's a group of us doctors who headed over, and um, once again, we had you know, typical doctors. We, we brought, because we figured we'd be on a long flight. We first ended up in Hawaii. And oddly enough, the thing that impressed me about Hawaii was for the first time I saw a koi pond in the, in the, um, in the airport. They said, someday when I get back, I'm going to have a koi pond. Um, and I do have one. <laughs> <laughs> it took me years that I got one. Um, so we ended up going from Hawaii to Vietnam, and we figured, oh, you know, we better be prepared for Vietnam. One of the other doctors is going, we should take, you know, a, a sleeping pill so we have enough sleep and we're ready. Well, we took a sleeping pill, but it hadn't worn off by the time we got there. So there's a group of doctors standing in the middle of the of Tonsonu Airport going, we're going to die. We have no idea where to go. They're going to shoot us any minute. And finally they sent someone out to get us, brought us back and said, okay, here's where you go. And um, I was sent to uh, Wei Fu Bai. And Fu Bai um, was the, the um, nearest sort of like mash unit that was um, operating uh, to take in casualties from Wei. Wei was still occupied by the NBA, and there was street-to-street -street fighting going on and so forth. Um, during that time, I was a general medical officer. I would do, um, uh, do, do triage and um, take care of uh, medical problems. At that point, we, we really didn't have anything uh, to do with uh, medical problems except uh, transfer them to the, the ships. We really couldn't handle uh, major head wounds either. Um, if we could get them to the ship, they would survive. If not, um, they wouldn't. During that time, um, we'd be doing operations at, in Fubai, and there'd be rockets that would come in. Frequently, during that time, um, while we were operating, you hear shrapnel hitting, hitting the roof of the bus units. Um, and uh, you just have to continue with the operations. And uh, once we had to bring a patient into, before he get into the operating room, they shot rockets in. So we had to bring him into a, a bunker. And as I was talking with him, he was a really young guy, probably way under age 20, probably 18, 19. And he was really scared. He's going, you know, I'm really scared. I think I'm going to die. And he had just a little hole in his abdomen. They go, oh, don't worry, you're not going to die. But this doesn't look that bad, and we'll be able to take care of you. Well, they brought him finally into the operating room and opened him up. And uh, he, the small wound really turned out to be a piece of shrapnel that went in and pierced his aorta. And he bled out almost immediately and died. So, uh, It was very different <clears throat> from, you know, you know, like here's a picture of me when I first left my parents' home in Rhode Island. And, you know, young, uh, rather arrogant probably, um, uh, naval officer who um, had no idea what he was getting into. That's me heading off to St. Albans. And that's with me and my sister. Then I got to Vietnam, and um, very different. Uh, here are some pictures of the first day I got to Vietnam. And there, um, I realized immediately the kids were running alongside the bus and so forth. I thought that was really cute. But I noticed they had wire on the, on the, the windows of the bus. And I said, why are you having wire? And he goes, well, we're afraid that the children will throw grenades into the bus. 
And I said to myself, we've lost this war. If they're afraid of kids in a rear area throwing grenades in, then the people really don't want us here. Um, so that stuck in my mind. This, this gives you an idea of what a must unit is. And it's, um, and this is where we did operating. This is what I was talking about with the operating rooms. Wow. And yeah. um, they, they were inflatable, basically. <laughs> and the thing we worried about when shrapnel would hit was that hot shrapnel would come down and get close to the uh, anesthesia because the anesthesia we were using was explosive. And it, it could, not only the shrapnel could kill you, but if the, if the anesthesia blew up, mm -hmm. we'd be dead too. So that, um, that was going on. I remember another guy who I was walking along and he was just cowering in the, on the side of the, the, um, the, the intake unit, uh, triage unit, and I said, what's going on with that guy? And he says, well, he's the only one who survived from his unit. The only way he survived was pulling dead people over him. And the NBA came by and basically stabbed the, the bodies. And he was totally, totally freaked out. Yeah. Um, this, is, this is one of the helicopters that, um, that would bring in wounded and bring people into, um, into combat. So basically, um, with, with that um, aircraft, uh, I had lots of experience with that coming up later. First I was in, in, as I said, I was in Fubai, Hue. I went to Hue once, um, not quite, quite sure exactly why. <laughs> um, I have gaps in my memory um, from, from not only PTSD, but probably from some brain injury. And uh, I remember going into Hue and the bridge over the Perfume River was down. And the smell in white was just horrific. It was just horrible. And the street, street fighting going on. Um, and we had to go in by boat because there was no other way to get there. But that's all I remember. Um, and that was one of the biggest battles of the war. At that time, they were able to use planes and they were bombing uh, the Citadel where the NBA were, were uh, entrenched. At that time, I also had, um, I had Vietnamese interpreters and I began understanding the, the horrific problems the Vietnamese are going through. Um, she, the first one I had was someone who actually in the past was a VA motor squadron leader. And when the NVA took over uh, Hue, they, um, use this opportunity, the VC, the local VC, to get family feuds settled and so forth. And so they killed their entire family. So she decided to switch sides. One of the, she would come in handy when I had Vietnamese to talk, talk to and, and, and treat. The, um, one, of the, one of the women I remember was a mother a Vietnamese mother who was in a foxhole with a young baby and she had a machine gun and they, um, of course in the conflict, the baby was killed and the mother was wounded. And I asked her, what possessed you to stay in the, in this foxhole? And she said, the NBA gave me a choice. I could take, I could go in there and you know, here's a machine gun, you, you AK-47, you, you, you keep off the Americans and we'll let the rest of your family live. And she said, okay, the only thing, my baby's too young, so I let the, the rest of the family go and I kept the baby, hoping that the baby would survive. And the baby didn't. So that began to really uh, impress upon me what what it was, uh, you know, a civil war that was just horrific. Um, the next thing 
that I did. I went from there to uh, Don Ha. And Don Ha was doing the same thing as a general medical officer. However, the one big difference is it was also within artillery range of the of the um, Korok Mountain. They had some really large um, artillery there. And every now and luckily they didn't have that much ammunition. So every now and then you hear this boom in the distance and you go, uh-oh. And they had to take cover. Uh, the, the, in the beginning, I would be standing up in the in the bunkers, and the corner would say, what are you doing, Doc? Get down. <laughs> I said, but we're in a bunker. And he goes, they're big shells. They'll just, if they hit this, they'll just ruin it. They'll come right through. So you increase your chances of living by lying down. And um, I'm going, oh, I guess this might be serious. <laughs> so I, I started doing that. Uh, since I figured they, they were usually back from the field and they knew what was going on a lot more than I did. Um, after that, I was uh, assigned to Battalion 1-9 because half the time we'd be out in the field with a, a unit like 1-9, half the time back in the rear with, with um, you know, like mass units. So, one nine was notable in that it was called the Walking Dead, and that they this was a name given to them by uh, General Jiap, who was the head of the North Vietnamese armies. Evidently, one nine had um, annihilated a battalion of Ho Chi Minh's favorite uh, military group, and he said, "I want them followed at all times and attacked at all times." And, and Job said, they will be, and they'll be known as the Walking Dead. Well, you know, as Marines being Marines, I said, yes, <laughs> we'll take that day, we'll be the Walking Dead. And um, they ended up with the largest amount of casualties uh, for any Marine unit in the war. So the first day there, I rode up with the battalion commander and uh, and a, a corpsman, and Black, Blackie was the commanding officer's name. He was a Mustang, and I, I don't remember the name of the, the corpsman. Uh, one of the things about me remembering names is after a while, I stopped remembering names because people would die. Uh, I just didn't want to get to know them by name. So anyway, we drove up to one nine. He said, well, I have to go off to a battle. And meanwhile, while, while we're in a battle, you've got to stay at the battalion aid station, get to know the corpsman, figure out what you need at the battalion aid station, and we'll go from there. So he drove off with the, with the uh, corpsman to go into this, into this battle. And so I met the doctor there who said, well, this is great, I can leave, goodbye. <laughs> and um, he said, um, uh, I'm really glad to leave. So I decided, okay, what I had to do is walk around. And I started talking to the corpsmen who were behind, and, and they had, uh, they were burnt out. The morale was terribly low. Um, they had sustained extensive casualties. And um, walked into one tent, and one of the corpsmen was sniffing uh, ether and just going around in circles looking at the top of the tent. And the more I saw, the more concerned I became about what was happening in, in, the, in one nine. I mean, it was you know, in combat way too long. But there's nothing I could do about that. Well, they came back uh, from this battle where they had gone in, they had inadvertently, well, against Blackie's orders, gone into this ambush. Um, there was a three-pronged hill, and they said, don't go up there, and one of the, the um, uh, company commanders did, and fell into a major battalion-sized ambush. And they kept putting, to save them, they kept putting more and more Marines in, with more and more casualties. Mm -hmm. um, the the uh, 
company commander was severely wounded who led the attack and was left, uh, they, they couldn't get him out. So they hit him and they, they came back to camp. When they came back to camp, the corpsman I had ridden up with was, had been killed and the battalion commander was wounded. Uh, shrapnel in his ass. Uh -huh. um, and so he had, he, he was a really good commander actually. And um, the, at that point I was going, I had better keep my cool. Don't show any emotion, be strong. You, you know, you've seen, you've seen cat, you know, seen stuff in emergency rooms before. And you know, you're the doctor, so you have to be, you can't, you can't blow it. And the, the uh, battalion commander, Blackie, looked at me and he goes, you must have, have uh, ice in your blank veins. You're not showing any emotion whatsoever as to what's going on. So he was really upset. Um, and, uh, but he didn't know what was going on inside of me. So the next day, or right after that, they called in B-52 bombers to bomb the area where they had been ambushed, which actually killed the commanding officer, the, 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 that commanding officer, the, the officer who led the attack, because uh, he was hiding there and they just wiped the whole area out. So that was my introduction to 1-9. That was my first day. <laughs> um, so they, they had a while to recuperate and then it was time to go out on another, another mission. And at that time, the two, two corpsmen who were supposed to go out just broke down and said, I can't go out anymore, Doc, I just can't go out. Um, I don't care what you do to me, I just can't do it anymore. And so I said, uh, okay, um, I'll take your place. So I told the commanding officer, these two men really are not fit to go out. And so I'll go out in their place. Um, you get a doctor instead of two corpsmen. Of course, they were better prepared than I was, but I didn't know that at the time, and I didn't care. Um, I was young, young and stupid. Uh, so as we're getting ready, the, the rest of the corpsmen you know, gathered around me and said, okay, you have to have a, a you know, you get, get, get a, your knapsack ready. So they put all sorts of things in, like, you know, chest tubes and, you know, I didn't carry that, I didn't carry ammunition. I had like a 45 and ammunition for that. But that was what, you weren't supposed to carry more than that. Uh, so they packed my stuff in with medical supplies, uh, you know, food, you know, you know, like we were going to be out for a while, so we had to bring food for a couple of days. And so I had my pack all ready. And I went to put it on, I put it on upside down, and everything fell out. <laughs> and, was, and everybody laughed and go, great, <laughs> this is going to be good. <laughs> so I had to repack it again and we went out. And I really, I really don't remember what happened. Um, the, the next thing I remember was uh, one, one Marine uh, talking to me going, okay, we're in a minefield, and I'm gonna lead you through the minefield. And you have to fight, you have to actually pay close attention and step where I step or we're both gonna die. And I just go, whoa, okay. And I looked around and everything got incredibly clear. Uh, the greens were very green. We're in this just absolutely beautiful area. There was this, this uh, meadow surrounded by trees and everything was just green. I could hear the insects buzzing and it was warm but not really hot. And I just looked at this guy, his name was, was Oliver. Oliver Sipple. <clears throat> and uh, I said, okay, let's go. And, it, and I made such a connection with him that I've never had before or since. Um, I mean, we had to really connect with one another and work as a definite team or else we'd both be dead. And so we got through that. And, um, 
And that, that was my first remembrance of, of being in serious danger. Um, oddly enough, with Oliver and I became close friends and actually became lovers. Um, and I used to go out on small unit patrols with him. Uh, he was also the one who saved uh, President, um, the President's life, <laughs> I'm blocking out, because the squeaky from tried to kill him. And he's the one that pushed her hand away. Really? And, yeah. And um, so it, and it's funny because I had forgotten who he was. I had been got a magazine and his picture was there. And I said, I know this guy, I know this guy. And I put it away. And, I, and years later, when I was working at the VA at, at Menlo Park in the PTSD unit, he comes up and he goes, Dr. DeMaio, I've been looking for you. I thought you'd been dead. Um, remember when I laid you through the minefield? And remember when we went on the night patrol to Quezon? And remember when we made, made love? And I'm, I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm thinking, gosh, you know? And then, and he goes, but he, he was, at that time, he had heart, heart trouble because of Agent Orange, probably. And, and he was drinking pretty heavily. And uh, he left the unit the next day. And one of my friends, Barbara Chippen, went to see him, visit him, and said, you know, you two really have to get back together again. But before we were able to, he died uh, with a heart attack. So anyway, there I was, um, back to 1-9. <clears throat> I would go out with them on all their their um, operations, and get, I, I'm, it's it's interesting because I, I mean I was never that trained, but I could keep up with them. Um, I remember flashes of things such as you know, crossing crossing rivers and getting to a river where there's been a firefight and seeing bodies float past. And that's where I had to get my water, because that was the, the important thing, is getting water. Uh, because that was one of the things I could give some wounded. If they had a chest wound or could give them water, abdominal wound, you couldn't. Um, learned how to cover sucking chest wounds <laughs> with a cigarette pack. Uh, on the outside, there's cellophane. You just put it over that and it will stop a sucking chest tube. I always carried a, um, also a chest tube too, and enough stuff to do tracheotomy. Um, <clears throat> so during that time, I also, there was one time where we, we hit this, this village. Um, and there wasn't any fighting, but they, they lined up all of the, uh, people and searched them and asked if there were any, um, any weapons in the village. And they were um, very fairly friendly, but obviously, I mean, the Vietnamese soldiers we were with would um, actually do some, some torture to the, to the uh, Vietnamese men trying to get answers. So that was the first day, and the second day, I had we had no food. By that time, I was so hungry, I had uh, jumped out a small banana tree and peeled it out and ate the inside because I figured that could, that could be really bad. Needed something to eat. So the next day, I still had no food. We did have water because there was a stream across the village. And I figured I'd go in. I had some medical stuff, and I'd go in and do medical a med cap, which is medical care in the village. So I went in there and they were, the bees were really surprised that I was there. And so I tried doing what I could with the, with the beds. And noontime came and to my shock, they actually fed me because they realized I had no food. Um, and it, it started a very interesting time in my life because we were there for a while. And all of a sudden there was this one a woman who was very elegant, very pretty, spoke several languages, Vietnamese, French, and English. 
And she and I became a team working with, um, with the villagers, uh, providing medical care. Um, I called, uh, I got another uh, helicopter came in, brought me a whole bunch of medical supplies. So I could do things pretty well. The first night, however, um, well, shortly after that, there was a pretty awful incident. There were several nurses who tried to get, who had wounded in the village, who were trying to get them out, and they didn't make it. Everyone was killed except for one nurse who was severely, severely injured. And so I called in the helicopter and I tried starting a, a IV on her because I felt, you know, she's non-combatant, she's another medical personnel, I have to get her out of here safely. And the other, other men that wanted to kill her, basically, they were going, get out of the way, doc, we're going to shoot her. And I, I just wouldn't. So I, when the helicopter came, I put her on the, on the helicopter and they took off. And I still don't know whether, whether she made it or not, or whether she was you know, whether she thrown out of the helicopter. And she had a very serious leg wound. So the next day, um, I would always be met with kids as I was going in there. They would take my hand and bring me into the village. And I never knew why um, until it was, it was time to go. And the, the whole road to the village was mined. And they were basically leading me through all the mines. Every day, and when I finished work, I usually go with the village, and and I had the only bar of soap in the village. <laughs> and believe it or not, soap is a medicine. It's amazing what soap can do with infections. And so we go down to the river, and everyone would use my bar of soap and we'd have a bath. <laughs> and once I left my watch there, and I walked away, and they came running after me, saying, "You left your watch." Now that's unusual because in that country you could leave anything down and they would take it. But since I arrived there with less than what they had, I had no food, nothing, um, they responded by really taking care of me. Um, the, the, the villages that we saw were, would have things that you just wouldn't see in the United States, from recovering polio to, um, Bivani play. And um, we did that with a couple of other ones. There was one Montagnard village that I went, uh, went to with one of my corpsmen. And at that time, it was considered too unsafe to actually have a Marine group go with us for safety. And we decided we'd just go anyway. We decided to bring AK-47s, not AK-47s, M-16s with us. And um, as we were leaving, the battalion commander who refused to give us an escort said, you know, you're not supposed to be carrying an M-16 as against the UV convention. And I said, well, I gotta do something to protect myself. So we went to this village and um, started working. We also brought a case of beer to give to them, and um, it, it was it was pretty shocking. There were a lot of them were dying of, of uh, cholera, and um, they they had been moved out of their traditional home into a resettlement village, and they weren't doing well. So we worked a lot during the day, and as we were working, all of a sudden there were these people in black pajamas with carbines that came and just lined the place. And so I asked the village chief, are there any VC around here? And he goes, oh yeah, there's a whole bunch down the street, down the road, but if you don't know it, they won't bother you. And I said, we don't know it at all. So um, we went and finished that day. And as we were leaving, of course, you know, me being the absent-minded and really, really not terribly military, uh, left my, a my M16 there. <laughs> they had to come running after us to give it to us. And um, that was surprising because there was a whole feeling that the Vietnamese really hated the Montagnards, which was a different tribe. 
and we felt that they would really want to keep the weapons uh, for when we left and the war was over and they may need them for either protecting themselves or going for independence. Um, <clears throat> so we, we um, on the way back, we came across this home and on the, on the veranda, on the, on the deck, there was a row of uh, Vietnamese lying with, with um, IV bottles in them. No one was around. It was very quiet. And the chief and I looked at one another and we go, and we went up and looked around and we said, these guys are really sick, probably with, with cholera or whatever. And there's other, there's got to be other people around. We're being watched. And so he said, we better get out of here now. So we went back to the jeep and went back to the battalion headquarters. Um, the most traumatic thing, as far as combat, that, that I experienced, and, and I, I was in quite a lot of combat, was a helicopter assault. And they would take us with one of these helicopters, and they brought us into, um, you had to sit down outside first, the helicopters came, and you get into the helicopter and go, at that time, I mean, I was, I was still, I'm invincible, I could do anything. <laughs> yeah, I, um, we landed, and immediately got hit. Um, and I went to one area, we collected the wounded there, we immediately had like 20 casualties right away. And all of a sudden there was, like we were here, there was um, a boy around and boom, we were bracketed. And the next time someone, a uh, helicopter came in to pick up the wounded, they came closer to the room, they were waiting for the helicopter. And meanwhile, one of our helicopters was having a fight with them, with the mortar team, and they were shooting back, and the helicopter was shooting at them. Another helicopter came in, boom, you know, very much closer. I figured, um, at first I thought it was ours, and I went to the, I ran over the battalion commander and said, you know, what, um, what's going on? You're hitting too close to us. He goes, those aren't our mortars. We don't have any more mortars and we have 20% casualties. And so I went back to where we were and same thing happened when another helicopter came in, the mortar rounds came closer. And at that time I did one of these things I watched in the movies with cover my cover one of the guys with my body. And I figured, oh I'll do that. And they realized I was really scared. <laughs> I kind of looked at the guy and said, I'm really scared about you. We go, yeah. So he got out of there and um, just, and I figured the next round would get us. Um, so the helicopter came, started coming in. But at that time, the helicopter dueling with the, the team that was doing the mortars uh, got the mortar. And actually, they, they, uh, the Marines actually captured the mortar, so we lived. And uh, then we had to move. Um, so we moved to this area where there were um, huge bomb craters and, and uh, bunkers that the, the NVA or VC had made. So we're in the middle of this NVA camp, and I'm going, this is not a good place to stay. We're going to get hit. And one, we don't know whether any of these bunkers have tunnels in them. Well, um, they, they did hit us. Um, they started out with water rounds, and I, and I was basically, uh, basically taking care of wounded. I had dug into a side of a, there was this huge crater where probably a 500 pound bomb had gone. So I dug into the side of that and I was basically using that as a foxhole. They'd been wounded to me. I'd be treating them. And then they would uh, uh, take it away. And at that point we couldn't medevac anyone. Well, the next thing I knew 
is that um, it was the next day and I don't remember anything other than the fact I was out of my foxhole and I was next to a pile of you know, dead bodies. And what had happened was I'm sure that I was you know, knocked out with, with motor rounds and they followed up with a, a ground attack. Now somewhere along here I've got, I've got something that talks about that. Um, not quite sure where it is, but I'll find it eventually. So I left there basically having a concussion and got on the, um, of all things, we flew in, all this what happened, and they picked us up the next day in trucks. And it was like surreal. You know, how? I mean, drive up with a truck and pick us up and take us back to camp. What did we accomplish? You know, what were we doing? Um, you know, before then, we were in Quapiat, where it was wet and rainy. And there had been a battle there with so many dead from the Vietnamese that our Amtrak rode over them. Um, but that ended with no further thing until we did the, the uh, helicopter assault. So anyway, this is what I looked after, after that. I'm in the middle. And to put it mildly, <laughs> I was in very bad shape. Um, this was a after several months of almost continual combat. And, um, That's really interesting that a lot of us regular civilians wouldn't think about the concussions that you would get from the right. explosions. Yeah. We all think that, oh, you're going to get right. shot up or blown up or, right. you know, broken bones. And, but the, just the fact of that concussion, yeah. that's yeah. huge. The last thing I remember was right. tying someone's head, wow. the head wound, and that was it. Yeah. Um, in the, uh, so in the rear, this is this is what would happen. We would sometimes get back, mm -hmm. and those were some of the other doctors and me. Um, and that was the officers' club. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so anyway, shortly after that, um, I came down with cerebral malaria, and I refused to believe it. Um, you know, it I think. Marine training probably got to me, and they kept saying, "No, I'm okay. I can keep going. Don't worry, I'm okay." And um, the corpsman said, "Okay, what we're going to do is just wait until you pass out, and then take you back to the thing," which it happened. Mm -hmm. And um, it was it was really serious. With I had falciparum and vivax malaria, two types of malaria, um, and the the the. Um, falciparum was resistant to everything, so they didn't know. They figured the only way that I could live was bringing me, medevacing me to the hospital ship, sanctuary, which they did. Um, I remember them pouring water on me at the um, at the, the battalion at the the, uh, the mass unit, and them. I don't remember them talking about it other than saying, you're really thin, you don't look really good. And then I remember being medevaced and being really scared that I was going to be shot down. I got there and I don't remember anything other than I basically thought I had been captured and refused to tell them my name or anything else about me. And so I was listed as missing in action for a while. And the people from the other doctors came out to visit me and so they knew who I was. They moved me to a different room and um, and so they, my parents were notified at that point that I was alive. Uh, there was a fire on board the ship and I was still thinking I was captured. Um, and so I basically thought we were under attack and went and hid under a pile of laundry and it took them an enormous amount of time to find me. And I made two attempts at escaping 
<laughs> dragging my, because I wanted to go back, I was trying to escape to my unit again. So I'd be dragging my, my, um, my, my IV bottles <laughs> back, because they were giving me IV, um, uh, IV, oh, quinine, because it was the only thing that would really stop it. And the four of us brought in, uh, I think two of us lived, one or two of us lived, the rest died, because it was just so resistant. Um, this is a picture of the, the, the doctor in, in the middle, this Dr. Giddings. He's the one that treated me in the two corpsmen. And the, the fun thing is, is that when I finished and got out, those two corpsmen met me and took me and said, well, you have to see what California is like. <laughs> and so they brought me to, um, up to uh, Lake Tahoe and we went to Grass Valley and, and, had, and it was really interesting. Because I had not seen it was snowing <laughs> up in town, <laughs> and um, so I then went um, was there for a while. I don't know how long. I was really um, delirious for a long time, and they really treated me very well on board the ship. Uh, the, finally I got to, uh, like, I would go down and they said, okay, now you can go down and get, like, some candy or whatever, and I went down and I could, I could figure out how to get back. I had to ask someone how to get back to my, my room. And I said, this isn't good. Um, then the next thing they said was, why don't you come and, and eat with us? So I was the only one there with camouflage on. <laughs> And I was used to only eating with a plastic spoon. And here I was, I kind of looked down at it, and the Navy for officers really know how to live. Mm -hmm. They had a tablecloth on, pure white tablecloth. Um, they had dishes that were in, you know, had Navy insignia on them, and all sorts of, of uh, utensils on either side. And I'm thinking, I'm just used to a plastic spoon. I don't know what to do. And one, one of the, um, they have Filipino stewards, and one of them came up next to me and said, no, pick up, pick up the fork on the left. You know, he guided me through the whole meal. Basically taught me how to eat again. And years later, when I was at, at the, uh, working at the PTSD unit in Menlo Park, he showed up and he says, Remember me? I'm the one that taught you how to eat. <laughs> how do you use a fork? <laughs> and uh, oh, cool. Okay. And uh, so, so that um, that was it. I uh, ended up be they ended up in, in the Philippines for a while, and I took that time. I said, I know I didn't like it long, but it was just wild. It was just crazy, very violent to me. And I said, I think I should just go to see what Manila's like. So I took a bus and went to Manila, and the people there were really, on the bus were really nice. They'd give me food and uh, got to a place, and actually I hired someone to take me around uh, Manila, which was interesting. I could see different things. And you could even see some of the, the bullet holes and shell holes where the Japanese had attacked Manila. Hmm. And so I came back to the ship and I said, we realize what you did was not been illegal. You're not supposed to have left and gone to, you know, of course I didn't know. And they said, so they went, they went before captain's mast and they said, don't do that again. <laughs> and go back. So, okay. So, um, so that was, that was it for the hospital ship. I mean, they definitely saved my life. I, I would have definitely died if they hadn't intervened because I wouldn't have made it without the nursing care. And one of the reasons why I felt that, that I had been captured is my, the nurse that was assigned to me was Asian. And I thought that I had been captured by the NVA. <laughs> um, and we were told in, in field med school that if you were captured as a physician, that you, uh, just give up everything because they had no intention of returning you. They were going to use you as a physician. And so the chances of you being returned to the United States was nil. Um, 
um, so the thing to do is get along the best you can. So I figured you know, I'd escape. <laughs> um, so anyway, they, they finally re released me. Um, I had one time when I was talking with my, my mother and I was completely out of it. And what they did was they had a relay. They would go from the ship to this relay point and then to my parents. And he, the one that was doing the relay figured that was making absolutely no sense whatsoever. So he made up the entire conversation. <laughs> um, and all this time I had been, I had been telling him that I was in any sort of combat or any danger. And I'd been, I finally got a letter, uh, oh, from my grandmother. And I, re I realized that was one time I really screwed up. I said, I have a really great view from my bunker. And then I was telling him about the Martin Yards and how they were starving to death. And, uh, and I, I, after my grandmother died, my cousin sent it to me. So it's a very, very interesting letter that um, I have. So anyway, I got back and landed at Da Nang and you know, being a doctor and going, well, what do I do next? I said, well, I should go to the Da Nang hospital and see if I can spend the night there and figure out how to get back to 3rd Med Battalion. So I did, and that night, of course, they were rocketed, and I'm like, <laughs> I'm back again, I don't like this at all. And uh, got, they said, get under the bed, I'm like, get under the bed, that's not going to help. But the nurses were incredibly brave. They were walking up and down, making sure all the patients were okay and safe, and um, I was very impressed with them. And later on, and I, I got to know one Linda Vanderventer and um, some of the others. And I read one of the books they, they produced of poetry that the, um, the, the nurses wrote. And they were very, very powerful. Years later, I decided to, well, I, I get back to that later. Anyway, I got back and I was uh, assigned to 3rd uh, third, third Battalion again. And so uh, my days being out in the field with 1-9 were over, which was okay because it was like, there's a very big difference between treating large numbers of people you don't know and people in your battalion that you're close to and treating friends and having um, the crewmen that had one nine, the, the casualties were uh, just enormous. Um, about 90% got killed or wounded. Um, anyway, back at the, um, back at 3rd Med Battalion, one of the things they wanted to do in Quang Tri, I was stationed in Quang Tri at that time, was to establish a medical unit that could take care of things such as Japanese bee encephalitis, uh, malaria, shigula, medical problems that could be taken care of um, locally. So um, this is my little group. I was, I was, there were several of us that, um, that would take place I know. So young. I know. We were kids. We were, we were really kids. It's amazing. And um, there's another picture of me there. And, mm -hmm. and so we hmm. we started this unit and. I still had to do triage, and <clears throat> and this is another picture of me. Um, So this, this was an example of um, what it looked like. 
during the monsoon, se monsoon season, things would get just absolutely wet. And we actually had a few people that were in uh, an outpost drowned. They got oh, caught wow. um, in the monsoon rain. And one of the pictures I had that I can't find is with one of the corpsmen who has a, pa a roll of toilet paper like over his head. <laughs> and he's like waist deep in water going towards the, out out <laughs> you know, <with> the toilet. <laughs> Which was, which was humorous at the time. It's great that you have some of those. Um, wow. and, and this is one of the medevac helicopters that was, was landing at the time. This was what the ward looked like. Just as we were opening it, we had Meanwhile, while running the ward, you also had to go to the to triage. And I remember uh, a couple of things about triage. One was, um, there were times when we basically couldn't do anything for people, and we put them behind screens. Um, people who were badly injured, but who we could get to, um, to, to the operating room, uh, we'd bring them to the operating room and then other people with minor injuries we'd get to later. And after everything was done, I remember one young guy was behind the curtain and um, there was nothing we could do for him. He was just going to die. And so I did not want to see him. I, I, I couldn't let people die alone. So I would sit with them. <clears throat> then one day, I was in the um, in triage, and someone came in and started shooting uh, the, a, their M16 into the roof. I, with my training immediately, I went towards. I was running away. I went towards the. the shooting and found out it was uh, Oliver and he had been ambushed and his entire team uh, except for himself had been killed or wounded. He was very good but young war there's always someone who's going to be better. So basically I, um, I ended up saying you know, what's happening? Uh, let me have your let me have the M16 which he gave me and then I ended up admitting him to the psych unit at that time, which is which is probably the point. Usually in combat, there's at least one point where you you kind of like develop PTSD, and I'm sure that was his point because he took his job very seriously and he was very good at it. Um, not all of his men died; a lot of them were wounded. Many died, but he blamed himself for getting into an ambush. Um, he survived that. Uh, and uh, and then then went to uh, went back to to his unit. And I actually one day they came by and it was at night time, me guys Okay, Doc. Let's let's go on on a mission back to Quezon and see what's happening there. And so I thought I said no, but <laughs> when I met him again, he told me yes, you went with us. <laughs> and I don't remember it. But a lot of this by that time, you know, I had some brain damage from the concussion. Um, so it was like I was a lot of stuff I don't remember. I remember there was only two times when I just lost it completely. One time was um, when I was with 1-9, and it was after a battle, and 
um, one of the officers came in and said, you know, two of our corpsmen just get killed and we want you to write a letter. I said, write a letter? Two corpsmen? I never even met them. They weren't here long enough for me to meet. And I just got really angry and just walked out. And I, I really regret that. I think I should have gone and done the letter anyway. But it was like, like I, I, was, I was just reacting. Um, and then the other time, is one of the things I did was I would um, sort of adopt <laughs> people in special forces and recon, uh, because a lot of them may not have, a, have anyone to, any doctor. And in fact, that's how I met Robert Chippen. Uh, one day at, in uh, Gunnar Mountain, uh, he brought in a bunch of wounded and uh, I was totally overloaded, and so he helped out. So that's, that's how actually we met. Mm -hmm. um, and with with, huh? mm -hmm. with recon, it's um, one of them would be wounded, and the others would immediately not leave his side at all. I mean, even in the hospital, they'd be under the bed, on the bed. Mm -hmm all around, and I, I encouraged that, because I, I thought that it was a team that had to be kept together. And it, in some ways it, it, it paid off in that um, one time one guy, the, the team came, one team came up to me and said, this one guy is not making it in our team. And unless you get him out of here, Doc, we're going to have to kill him, because he's going to, he's, he's really, putting our lives in danger. And I looked at the guy, and he was a team member with the guy, and Greg is a He goes, yeah, I'm just not, I'm not good enough for them. And so I had to figure out, if I get a way of getting him removed, but they trusted me enough to do that. Another time, you know, they're on amphetamines frequently when they went out, on long range patrols and stuff. And they'd come back, and there's one, one group that came back, and they started drinking. And then started playing with their rifles and one guy shot, killed one of the teammates who was his like best friend. And so they called me over and he was just devastated, the whole team was. And so then I yeah, I wrote it down as an accident because it was. And a lot of things like that. Um, there's on the lighter side, there was one guy who uh, Lady Osha came up and said, well, my aide finally told me that he, when he was young, he lived on a farm and he had sex with, with um, sheep. And he says, do I have to get rid of them? And I, I said, I wouldn't. He said, I don't think there's many sheep around here anyway. <laughs> so he kind of laughed and, and, he, and went. And uh, another, another little, little story was one guy came up and said, you know, Doc, I really, I don't think this is true. My wife asked me to send her a sample of my, my semen, and she said that she used it and got pregnant. And I said, is that possible? And I'm thinking, oh, it really is it. <laughs> but how do I handle this? How do I handle this? And I said, well, it's possible. <laughs> it could happen, you know? And, and I figured that that was the best I could do at the time. Um, all sorts of little stories like that uh, would come up. The, um, the, then the time came for me to, to go, you know, and I'm looking back. And there were good times as well as bad times that I really remember. Um, I remember just before I went, um, I, I did see one of the corpsmen I, I worked with, mm -hmm. um, yeah, and uh, he was really close. You know, we used to sit down and watch sunsets together, um, and said he had come back from a, an operation. I said, "Oh, great, you made it." And then as I was leaving, I said, "You yeah, know, how's he doing?" And he goes, "I don't think he made it." And I said, okay, "Oh, okay." Because um, by that time, I mean, it was just so many people who were dead that it was just another thing. Um, 
So to make a long story short, then it became time to leave. And they had like a bon voyage. How long were you there for, total? I was there about 13 months. 13 and months. they, somehow my orders to leave hadn't come through. So actually, they had listed me as an NBA prisoner. So <laughs> I could get out. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is the thing that, that talks about that um, helicopter assault. And, um, and that, gave me combat thing. Then as I was leaving, the, the head of the uh, medical corps, the medical battalion, uh, brought me into his office and said, do you want a Bronze Star or a Navy Commendation Medal? And I said, well, give the, the Bronze Star to one of my corpsmen because they deserve it. And um, I doubt if he ever did. I, I got, instead, I got the Navy Commendation Medal. I doubt if the corpsman ever got, ever got, uh, got any bronze stars. Um, I remember I had some difficulty with him in the past. There was one time when I was going from the battalion to bring some supplies to a CAC unit, which was a unit Marine unit that was in the village, another group that I kind of adopted. And I would bring them supplies. I, I um, hitchhiked to where they were and then started walking in, and I was stopped by this Vietnamese guy who suddenly appeared out of the bushes. He was very well built. And I go, Oh, I'm in a lot of trouble because I had no weapons whatsoever on me. And, and he didn't either. And he, and he just kind of looked at one another and I smiled and I said, hi. And I, I told him it means I was a doctor. And he, he said, and I, I was going there, he said, you can't go there. And brought me over and kind of taught me how to part, the, like there's a bush like this, part the bushes and look in between and the place where I was going to was under attack, mortar attack mm -hmm. at the time. And he said, can't go there. And he said, come sit down. So we sat down in a abandoned rice field. It was dry. And we looked for little kernels of rice and ate them and mm -hmm. kind of tried having a conversation. Um, and then all of a sudden he looked up and said, I'm leaving, and just left. I mean, it, I couldn't have been taken prisoner at that time, but I wasn't, nor killed. Um, then I walked in and they had, they had a number of casualties and stuff like that. And came back and told the battalion commander where it happened. And he goes, oh. <laughs> um, anyway, got home. Homecoming was different. Um, <clears throat> the first thing I had to do when I got off the plane was by a rifle, I couldn't sleep without a rifle next to me. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that was pretty normal at the time, because uh, that's how I'd been living. And so I, I got my station at uh, the the uh, at Treasure Island in San Francisco. And the reason why I chose that is that you could listen to the radio. And this song, um, if you come to San Francisco, wear flowers in your hair. I said, I've just got to go there. <laughs> and so I applied to San Francisco as my next duty station and got there. And I was made um, head of the, the medical uh, person in charge of the brig, medical officer for the brig. And at that time, uh, the brig of Treasure Island was pretty brutal the guards would frequently beat up people. And um, people would be put on bread and water as punishment. And I just refused to do that. I refused to sign anything. And I said, you know, I'm just 
don't think that's something I can do uh, being a physician. I just feel that's morally wrong. And later on, one of my friends, Greg Anderson, said, yeah, probably they beat him up instead. <laughs> um, one person, in, in one, one African-American guy, I remember, coming up to me after me saying stuff like that and looked and said, well, I can tell in your eyes here, there's something of a minority there. You've run into this before. And um, just left. And there was another, another guy who was gay and they had raped him. Uh, the old guards had raped him. And he was in there because he was gay, basically. Because at that time, you'd be arrested if you were gay, given a bad discharge. And, um, you know, at that time I knew, by that time I was having, I would be realizing I was gay. And I didn't know what to do with this guy. Um, so what I, what I did, the only thing I could do was write a long, no, just documenting everything he had gone through, being raped, getting out of rear from, from the guards, uh, being beaten, and being uh, forced to be uh, naked in the cell without any, any heat. Um, uh, so that's the only thing I could do there. At that time I moved into, um, didn't stay on base very long. I went to um, to San Francisco and got a place at uh, Twin Peaks with another doctor that I knew and a nurse. And the doctor um, just never was there. And the nurse was never there. <laughs> um, but she and I, actually she's here in, in Santa Cruz now. And she married another doctor right there who's also here in Santa Cruz. And um, she was saying, God, you were just absolutely crazy, which I, I heard more than once. He said, we, we wouldn't even walk down the street. You'd go from cover to cover instead of walking down the street. Uh -huh. And uh, my thing there was, it was good to be quiet and, and watch the fog come in and watch seagulls go past. And my other friends later on, many, many years later, said, yeah, you thought that was normal. <laughs> you know, um, and I, I saw, uh, you know, patients there as well. Did so that that was that was uh, San Francisco, um, and it was it was interesting because at that point on the way back from Vietnam, I figured that I just didn't want to do surgery anymore. I had enough of blood. Um, I had done quite a lot. So I didn't want to do any more. So I figured I, uh, you know, something definitely had changed in me and something was different. And I figured maybe I should go into psychiatry. In med school that was my uh, best subject actually. I was in the 90s there. And so I got my first year residency in San Francisco at Presbyterian Hospital there. And um, actually, before that, I should step back. When I left the military, I went back east and got a job at my, the old hospital I'd been at North Shore, because it was in between um, going to San Francisco for my residency. I had you know, several months to, to go. And when I got back there, actually there were a whole group of the residents who were really angry with me and said, we had to cover for you while you were in Vietnam. And, and they were really, really angry that I had gone uh, to Vietnam. <laughs> and one of the guys, uh, David Twitchell, said, you know, you guys don't know what you're talking about. He was in combat. This is not something he it was a vacation. Yeah. Um, so I lived at the... Um, they, they had a residence course. It was a very, very wealthy hospital. And they wanted Cornell to come there. So these wealthy people in North Shore said, we'll build a three-story um, apartment house for the residents, fairly furnished, and they'll, they can stay there. And so that's where I stayed at that time. And I would always watch TV with my rifle next to me. And one night, 
the the manager just he decided to come in and didn't tell me about it and I saw the door the dart hop going and the door opening and I immediately got my rifle and I was like that <laughs> she came in and she started screaming but it was like that was my normal reflex at the time and um, so that was over eventually and I went to San Francisco to uh, my first year of residency and uh, then went down to San Diego for the last two years at, um, at then the, what was in the county, which is now the county and the university have now combined. Uh, from the very youngest of the kid, you know, I always wanted to be a doctor. So that was always on my mind. It probably was one of the things that helped when I returned from from Vietnam. Because, I mean, I you know, did get into, you know, smoking pot, taking acid. I loved taking acid, taking acid and going in the woods. It was like being in Vietnam again. Um, one of my friends, uh, Richard, uh, and I, which I we were back here in Elvis, well, later on. Um, so I would meet with some of my friends and we'd take acid and go to the woods and stuff like that. And But I had to be careful. I couldn't go too much into drugs and alcohol. Alcohol was never my big thing. Um, but because I was a doctor and I had to function, that really put the brakes on. So. That was one thing that really saved me, is medicine. Um, years later, when I moved up to Santa Cruz, I was still doing, with Richard, we'd get dressed in camouflage, go out to Nicene Marks Park and, tra and track people. Uh, make sure they see if we could do it without them seeing us. And we were good. <laughs> I couldn't do that now. <laughs> um, and why, why did you end up in Santa Cruz? Was there a job here for you? Or? Well, and, um, believe it or not, um, I, at that point, I, I, Oliver and I had decided we'd meet in Santa Cruz. So I decided to go to Santa Cruz, and even though I thought he was dead. And there was a group of us that bought a farm, uh, an organic apple farm in Santa Cruz, uh, Oak Branch of 40, and went there. Um, which was odd, because I was doing really well in San Diego. I had, uh, oh, oh, one night in San Diego, I woke up with a policeman had pointing a gun at me through the window and, and said, open the door. And what happened is there was it was supposed to be a drug raid, but they had the wrong house. Oh and, um, <laughs> and they came into the house, they, you know, with guns and stuff like that, and said, "You know, you've got to uh, you know, put your hands up, and we're going to search the house." And they didn't. They didn't find anything. But I was totally freaked out, and because it was just I was having flashbacks and everything over people with guns pointing them at me. So I decided I had to buy my own home. And during, when I was in the military, I saved every bit of money I could and bought stocks and stuff like that. So I cashed them all in and borrowed some money and bought a place in Mission Beach. And then um, that had, had, a, had a wall around it, <laughs> which I, was necessary. And it also had a, um, had a, a little apartment over the garage, which I rented to a Vietnam vet. Um, and he, among other things, was, uh, I think he was a dope dealer, and he, um, to earn money, and, and he would do some, just some weird things, like he put a, a, a rocket into the trash one day, and totally freaked out the people collecting trash. And uh, then his, on his, he was telling me, this is my last trip being a dope dealer after this. I don't have to do it anymore. And he was coming down the street, and just before he got to the house, he was in an accident and was killed. Um, 
So I met, at that time, I also um, would be seeing people from, from my unit who would come by, and one, one guy who was hooked on heroin, and I said, okay, you got a room, go in, detox, and, which he did. Um, it, it was a, a very interesting time, the, the years after I had gotten back, because people were still coming in that I knew. Um, so then I moved into San Francisco, and at that point, there was all sorts of demonstrations going on at Berkeley. And being a Vietnam vet, I was not really welcome at all. I had um, gone back to, to UCLA as, and I uh, was doing the fellowship. Oh, God, I'm getting, bouncing all over the place. Um, well, actually, I was. This is in San Diego. Um, but that's a year after San Francisco. I was very, very upset by the, the um, fact I found coming back to the United States was I was running into a lot of violence and, and a lot of uh, problems with just coming back. Um, so, you know, coming back was difficult. Going, going to San Diego, and, you know, I, I, bought, I bought that one house and I said, I need another safe house. So I bought one in La Jolla. And I had an ocean view, and I don't know why I didn't keep these two houses, but I didn't. Um, and at that time, uh, Jerry Solomon, who's a psychologist here, uh, I knew, we were close friends, we were both I was in my residency, he was doing his PhD. And he told me years later, he never told me this when I was going through this, he said, you were, no, no, you were really crazy. He said, you, <laughs> if I knocked on your door, you would jump out the back window and go around to see who it was rather than answering the door. And, um, and he said, you had, you had a gun in every room and one in your car. Uh, and he said, you're still functioning. Um, these are some of the things that were going on. Um, so Sandy, San Diego, I really enjoyed. It was perfect for me. And, and Mission Beach at the time was very, very nice. It was a close little community. And I did um, some work at, um, I went and got a, I was working at the county at the time as well, and did, um, a fellowship at UCLA in community psychiatry. The, eventually I um, ended up in Santa Cruz and lived on the farm for a while then moved and um, had a relationship with, uh, with someone, and we decided to buy a house in, and I bought a house up in Bonnie Dune, in the middle of the woods, which a lot of a lot of vets really try to isolate, get out in the woods and stuff like that, which really, for me, was a mistake. Um, that broke up in a year, and I began noticing because I was alone for the first time, uh, that I had some really intense symptoms. Every night I would wake up, you know, sweating, my heart pounding, and I had to get up and patrol the house with a gun, because I thought it would be, there was some danger outside. It's going to be overrun, or um, there were enemy out there. And, um, just have horrific nightmares, night after night, after night, after night. And then there was, uh, so I began, at this time I was in private practice in Santa Cruz, and one day, who walks in but Robert Chippen, dressed in camouflage, and he goes, I need to deal with Vietnam. And I was having flashbacks talking with him, and I said, I think we both have to do this, and I can't help you because I'm having my own trouble. 
So the two of us got together, and we um, we didn't have there were no resources in Santa Cruz at the time. So we went over to San Jose and got great. We asked them to send over someone. So we went to the Bamboo at the time, which is right near my office on Seabright, and. waiting for, for Greg, and he walks in, and I go, okay, this is the guy, he's a Marine, combat Marine, I can talk with him. I would not talk with anyone else. Um, so Greg said he'd be willing to run the group. So we went around town putting up signs, sending anyone who wanted to discuss D-I-S, capital C-U-S-S, -S, Vietnam. <coughs> And um, we managed to get a group going, the first group going, a PTSD group uh, in Santa Cruz. So we'd meet at the Veterans Memorial Building, which at that time was easily accessible, and it still is for veterans. And we had our, our meetings there. The first time I remember going there, I just didn't trust anybody. Um, did not trust the older vets, and they were very welcoming. Um, one of them kept calling me comrade, and I'm thinking, is he a communist? <laughs> and I didn't even realize he was from World War I, and that's what they called each other, comrades. <laughs> and, um, and there were a couple of others that were really helpful. Um, so one of the first things I did was um, you know, I, I joined the Disabled American Veterans, and the one who was doing that was, was Ed Moogie. Um, somewhere around here. And this is, this is us being Ed, into the, Ed being to the Disabled American Veterans. And Robert's there too. <laughs> Um, Ed Moogie was, was an amazing person. He was like a, uh, someone who really did an awful lot of work for veterans mm -hmm. and taught me how to, you know, talk with politicians. We were meeting with, with uh, Panetta, and now I've met with his son. Yeah, well, and, yeah, yeah. and um, went to his son's inauguration. Nice. So he taught me how to do television and stuff like that. So we actually were pretty active in trying to get resources for Santa Cruz. Um, and, and we'd meet doing, this is our PTSD group. I'm the little guy there, and the other guy was, um, Bill Motto. Yeah, uh, Bill Motto. Huh? I know. Yeah. Bill Motto. Yeah. And, and, um, they named one of the VFWs. Uh, yes. Bill right. And mm -hmm. um, Bill was in our group. And he, I would always be arguing with the VA. And then um, Bill had, Bill was basically homeless. I mean, he would be couch surfing all the time. He was a, he was a, um, a, a, a medic. So one day he came up and said, you know, I have a heart problem. So I figured, okay, I could, I was doing private practice at the time. So I referred him to one of the cardiac people in Santa Cruz. And I got back to this thing saying, yes, he has um, cardiac arrhythmia. He said, but I don't want you ever referring any Vietnam vets to me ever again. And I said, well, because I'd be getting run into a lot of pushback from the medical community here about referring Vietnam vets. So then I began thinking, well, I've got to deal with the VA. And, um, and so at that time, Michelle Shippen, who showed, they weren't married, she was working with um, the Veteran Service Office. Uh, and Michelle is one of these incredibly brilliant people who actually made up um, a contract for us. And the contract was um, that Mark Salmon and I could be seeing veterans and be paid through the VA, which was sort of like the beginning of um, 
the, of, of getting a vet center down here, um, which we did. So I, I was doing a lot of workups on vets, and Mark was running a group, and we'd be you know, doing communicating with one another about what we had found and the different people. And at that time, uh, Robert Chapman and I would also work together going to different um, veterans' homes and or responding to police calls because they would call and say, well, we have a vet, he's holed up in the house, he's armed, do something. So we, you know, I remember once going to one and the police were all around me and, and they were all you know, the SWAT team and everything else. And I kind of looking around and all of a sudden I see the vet crawling along the side. And I go up to him and said, do not get up. Stay where you are and we'll get someone over here and make sure that you're safe. That's how we did that. And there was another couple that uh, were holed up in the mountains. And during the night he would come down and we'd have, have a a talk every night, and I kept telling you, you know, you got to really give this up. So eventually, it did stop. Uh, another time, Robert and I went to uh, a couple of times, or three that I remember that were really very dangerous. One was with um, a former um, board of supervisors person who was having, he was a veteran and was having a really bad time with recurrent. Things. He was he was um, in a lot of the banana wars. It was like in in some serious problems, and he was having a re relapse of some of that. And we walked into his house, and he pulled out a gun, and he just pointed at us, and he said, "I think I'm going to kill you." And somehow we talked him out of it, got the ammunition, hit it, put the gun somewhere else. And, we, and he was hospitalized um, at the VA. Another time, we were, one guy called up and said, I've just cut my wrist, it was really bad. And we went over to see him, and he had cut his wrist, he had stopped bleeding by that time. So we brought him to Dominican Hospital. And we go in there, it was Halloween, and the nurses, and his big problem was, you know, the bodies he had seen with, with bugs eating them and worms and stuff like that. And it was Halloween, we walk over to Dominican, we go into Dominican Hospital, and the nurses all have costumes on with bugs on their faces. And then the first thing they did was we're, we're, we're carving pumpkins, here's a razor blade. And he looks at me and he goes, I don't need this. That's crazy. <laughs> and I said, you don't know what you're doing, you can't give, you just cut his wrist, you can't give him. Oh, you know, a, a razor blade and, and all your decorations oh, are really freaking give take out. Take spiders off. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, so they, they caught on very quickly and, they, and it, it worked out okay eventually, but the beginning part. Oh, yeah. Then another one, he was very, he said he was very suicidal and to come over and get his guns. So we went over to get his guns and he gave us a bunch of them, left the room, came back with a shotgun, cocked the shotgun, he said, this is what's going to do the damage. And Bob and I looked at one another and kind of thought, we're going to be killed here. And he just gave it to us. He said, take this away because I don't want it. So that's some of the things that we're doing. We're doing a lot of work with vets who are having a lot of trouble. Um, then, um, during our group, uh, Bill Simpson called and said, we think that Bill Motto uh, has died. You have to go identify his body. And what had happened is he had fallen, his favorite place to go was out below the cliffs. And so he was there and he had a heart attack and fell off the cliffs and, and died. We had, he had to identify his body. We notified his mother, mother came by, and we had a ceremony for him at, at the cliffs where his favorite place was. He was cremated, and so we got some of his ashes and we were putting him on the place that he loved to sit down on. And at that time, a group of pelicans came by, flying in the mission, in the missing man formation. And just, we were just like, wow. And they were at eye level. Um, and then his mother 
uh, gave us the rest of the ashes. And if you go to the Veterans Memorial Building, Kenny Walker painted a picture of him and used the ashes mixed in with the paint. Wow. So that's, he painted with Bill. Wow. Uh, I gardened with Bill. And so Bill's part of my, my garden in Aptos. <laughs> and um, different people did different things. So he, he is remembered still. So um, that was coming back and dealing with it. I had, I w went into a lot of therapy, uh, individual and group. And um, Greg talked me into going to to uh, the VA, work at the VA. So I went there and worked at the, the uh, PTSD unit. And I began to see people who had known in Vietnam there. One guy looks at me and he goes, I remember you, you were really crazy. Everyone kept saying that. <laughs> he said, you were trying to mail a machine gun home to your mother. <laughs> and he said, I said, oh sure, we'll, we'll mail a machine gun home to your mother. And he said, I quietly put it under the thing. And I figured my mother would have liked it. <laughs> um, and then I, you know, I had met the guy that taught me how to eat again. And uh, then I met, uh, I was eating with Greg and um, I met Oliver again. Um, so the whole thing was, was very interesting. And after that, after about a year, I felt that um, I needed to move on a bit. And so I moved, I was the uh, head of psychiatry at, at San Jose uh, VA for a while. And then, um, then I decided to move, move on to Kaiser. And moved on to Kaiser, which was a lot better, uh, a lot better pay, and <clears throat> a really good retirement. During that time, or right after that, um, we had a reunion of, of they had several before and I just couldn't go. Um, actually, the DAV offered to pay me going to see the wall when it opened up and I, I just, I couldn't do it. Um, you know, I was doing things like I had a slideshow and I'd be, you know, showing people slides and and then the wind would come up and I'd go, oh yeah, that's my Corman who, who died. And, I'd put it away and somehow it would come up again in another thing. It just kept appearing. Um, and so anyway, eventually I went to one of the reunions for the 3rd Medical Battalion. And that was, that was interesting for me. Because um, right there I met, uh, I met the, these guys who I used to, used to party with in, in, uh, in Vietnam. I mean, I used to go to Da Nang. It was the first medical society to belong to, which is the medical society of Da Nang, da Nang in Vietnam. <laughs> and on the back, it, it tells you these things. Um, and, and and the, the interesting thing about getting back together with everyone again was just some of the surrealistic stuff that would happen that you said, oh, this really couldn't happen. Like, we had two tiger attacks and one, one tiger attack was the guy, um, was the guy, tiger came up, grabbed him from a foxhole and just dragged him away, you know, really big marine. And the other people ended up killing him the tiger. And then the second one was the same thing happened. There was a guy, a fox, a tiger grabbed him, took him out. And the guy had a, a 45, killed the tiger and beat him to death. <laughs> um, and there it was, this, yeah, pictures of the dead tiger and the tiger skin. Oh, and I said, ah, this is reality. Yeah. Um, that's crazy. So it was interesting talking with these guys again. Uh, I found it very stressful in a lot of ways, as well as not. Like, 
the doctors that took care of me said, do you know how long you were there? I said, on the hospital ship. And I said, oh, maybe a couple of weeks. And they laughed. They said, you were there much longer. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was, it was an experience contacting these people again. And a lot of them were had strokes and they weren't doing well mm -hmm. uh, physically. You know, we're all exposed to Agent Orange, which can cause everything from diabetes to heart trouble. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, what's my train of thought? <laughs> the, um, the next thing I decided to do was go back to the, I was to go back and, and see, see the wall. And so I, I did go back there um, and walked, walked up to the wall. And the first name I saw was my really close friend who was a crook. <sighs> who had been, you know, killed. He was a really close friend. Um, It does have an impact. And uh, so that was my one, one trip to the wall in, in walking around Washington. Uh, when, um, So after that, um, I've, I've, um, I've retired now, and I do uh, still do a lot of volunteer work with veterans. I, at one point, I was the um, was on the board of the Veterans Memorial Building, and was actually the president for a year. And <clears throat> I still do volunteer work with the Veterans Service Office, and. Um, basically write up veterans who have been in combat for benefits. Um, the, the interesting thing that I found when I first got out, uh, and I was, I was studying, I had to study for my boards, and I opened the book and I looked at the, at the brain and I couldn't identify a thing. And I said, oh, I'm in trouble. And basically I had to relearn psychiatry again because um, I am convinced that between the concussion and the, the um, cerebral malaria that I got some brain damage, which I never really admitted to myself <laughs> and didn't talk about for a long, long time. Um, but I did eventually pass my boards, so I relearned everything. And um, I'm still doing volunteer work with veterans. I have one this Tuesday. I, I do it with. And um, so that's that's about it. I've um, since you recently went in, uh, you went to Sacramento with uh, yes. one of the county supervisors. Was it a volunteer of the year award or veteran of the year award? Or yes, I was reading did. about this. What was that? Was that right. for your volunteer work or your? Well, I was. Um, uh, I got nominated as Vol veteran of the year for this. For this year, doing work with veterans, basically, Fantastic. and um, went to Sacramento. Had a really good time. They were very good to me. Showed me around. Showed me around. Sacramento had a great dinner. Wow. The um, and and I'm really thankful for that because it was a uh, um, Mark. Mark Stone, right? Yeah, yeah. Mark that, was, that was recently. Yeah, and Mark uh, Mark was there with me the whole time. I mean, he put a lot of time into it, right. and between him and his staff, they were wonderful. Nice. So I have a great deal of respect for Mark Stone. That's great. And um, so, yeah. yeah I mean, I, on the other hand, I'm very fortunate. You know, I'm very, very grateful for what I've got. I feel like I've been very blessed, mm -hmm. and that I have a really nice home. I. I've been with my uh, partner, who I, I married, 
uh, since 1981, have two poodles. And we were the first ones in California that the VA recognized as a married couple, same gender couple. That's awesome. Wow. Um, um, and that was due to, to Chris Lopez, who mm. was the County Veteran Service Office and, really? and Sam Farr, who was a, who was a very, very uh, strong veterans advocate. Uh, I've worked with both of them a lot. I remember mm. when um, Chris Lopez just got back from Iraq. He you know, was just a young kid at the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he ended up being the service officer for a while. And now he and his wife moved down south and live in uh, Morro Bay. And he's the uh, veteran service officer down there. Okay. Uh, and currently is Dean because we were very active in trying to get a veterans advocate program going. Mark Salmon and I worked on this a lot. We finally got one going, and we hired uh, uh, one guy for the first time. We had to make up everything. What do we do? You know? <laughs> but, and it, it's working out extremely well. Yeah. Uh, first one was Kenny, and he did a lot of work just on the street, walking up and down, talking to vets, bringing them in, getting them involved in, in, in the work. Um, Wednesdays, they had the Wednesday program, which was one-stop shop, mm -hmm. which would bring the VA um, and uh, HUD-VASH for, for housing right. jobs. Uh, so there'd be a whole group of resources there, including lunch, every, every Wednesday. Mm -hmm. So that's what they, they would start doing that. Mm -hmm. And um, then the next one was Dean, uh, Kaufman, who's now the veteran service officer, mm -hmm. and uh, Travis has moved into Dean's place. So it's yes. it's interesting to me to watch the next generation take off. Yeah. Um, good guys down there. Yeah. yeah. And so it's good, and I have my coin pond now. Okay. <laughs> so wow. I'm, I'm trying to do the whole thing that Japanese warriors do after they return from battle, and that is dedicate myself to to peace and you know do doing nice things like going to uh, like watching koi and collecting art and poetry and that sort of stuff mm -hmm. wow. and taking care of returning veterans because yeah. they're going through exactly the same thing I went through yeah. wow. that was amazing yeah, thank you for sharing that yeah. opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you well, maybe uh, follow-up questions. Your experience did, did it influence your your think your thinking about war or the military? Um, yes, it did. Um, I am. I have different a lot of different things. For it, first of all, when I went into the military. Um, I was pretty much of an agnostic, and when I came out, I was very spiritual. Um, I, I'm a strong believer in a, a good, strong military. Um, I would like to see it that everyone in the United States spends at least two years doing something. It doesn't have to be the military. It could be, um, you know, a, doing service like, you know, helping out in state parks or in different countries, whatever. But I, I think that this is something that, a way of paying back for our country because we really are, are very lucky to live in a place like this. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, would like to see more combat veterans in, in politics because I, I find that they know what war is and they're not so eager to go to war because they know what's going on. And I really, I'm really in favor, I'm really very positive of the military, but I'm not terribly positive about going to war. I mean, that should be our last, very last option. And it actually worries me today that there's some people in power now that seem to be erratic and not, not really taking into account the fact that 
if they start a war now, it could very well be a nuclear war where millions of people will die. So I think I am a major advocate <laughs> for peace because I've seen what war can do. And, and what would your advice be to anyone that is, wants to join the military? I think that's a good career for people. Mm -hmm. um, if they if they wish to do that, I'm all for it. Mm -hmm. The um, I'm more than willing to tell them of my experiences. Um, I I often wonder if I would have stayed in the military. But at that time, they <clears throat> being gay in the military was not a really good option because you could be jailed, bad discharge, and <clears throat> I could have lost my license, medical license as a result. Uh, but there were times and parts of it that I did enjoy. So if that hadn't been in place, like now, if you're gay, you can serve, I may have been, may have made the military a career. The um, thing that, you know, Obama was really good in getting gays in the military you can serve now openly. Um, and there was a time when transgender people could serve openly as well. And now it seems like uh, the president, Trump, doesn't want to have that happen. But he's running into a lot of opposition from the military, actually. Well, we, I went to one um, party after Don't Ask, Don't Tell was authorized. I went to one event, and at that point, the active duty military, you know, gays and lesbians, were already organized, and they had written to the Department of Defense and said, don't ask, don't tell, it's going to be repealed. We want to have the best and seamless transition we can have. So we'd like to be in contact with you, and we'd like to organize. And so the Department of Defense said, that's great, do it. And so they basically organized uh, using Facebook, of all things, <laughs> you know, the internet. And so uh, when that came, they decided there was already uh, an organization that was, that was viable. And so they decided to have uh, a conference, which they did. And the Department of Defense was there, and even the CIA was there. Um, and I went to it. It was, it was really a trip for me to look and see people, like two guys dancing together and being very military. I mean, the, I mean, you're looking at these young kids, I mean, there's no mistaking, these people were in the military. They acted that way, they talked it that way, they carried themselves that way, they dressed that way. Um, and yet they were being able to be openly gay and lesbian. That's awesome. And the, um, the, one of the things at that time, this was a while back, came up, you know, there's a tradition in the military, you can't leave anyone behind. And so the idea of transgender came up, and the feeling was we can't leave them behind. And at that time, the, I don't know what's happened since then, but the uh, CIA got up and they were talking and they said, we have a lot of money, and if you want to do anything, just contact us and we'll support you. So that was interesting. It was very positive, very a great deal of support. You know, I, I really think that anyone who is um, qualified you know, should be able to, to join the military and protect our country. Um, and that goes for all people. So anyway, the, that was an interesting experience. I also got the CIA tried to recruit me again. <laughs> no, no, I'm out of it. <laughs> no more. <laughs> uh, so that was about it. Okay. Well, any more questions? Anything else you can? You kept a lot. We really appreciate yeah. how okay. detailed it was, and you Very took much. your time and told your story. It was wonderful. Thank okay. you for sharing. Good. Thank you for Thank sharing. You. Really I hope I did okay. Yeah, I okay. did wonderful. Great. Yeah, we, Great. Uh, Great. Fantastic. Okay. Well, thank you for doing it. Thank you so much. Thanks. I should.